Ladies and gentlemen, 170 watts, 16 cores, that's apparently the targets for AMD's next generation Ryzen processors, powered by Zen 4. And if you think that's impressive, wait until we discuss the performance, and we're going to get right into it after this message from the video's sponsor. If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as home keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. So, of course, AMD's Ryzen 7000 series will be powered by the Zen 4 uh, architecture, and it's going to be a big jump in terms of performance over what we have with Zen 3, which is already pretty impressive. It's going to be a really interesting battle, I suspect, between Zen 4 and Intel's Raptor Lake, which will be the successor to its 12th generation Alder Lake uh, platform and when it comes to amd's performance of course one of the things that amd have enjoyed in the past is a core count advantage over intel but this has started to kind of change and really sh shake up a little bit over the past couple of generations and from my personal understanding uh, and I've mentioned this in multiple videos at this point, Zen 4 will only be featuring 16 cores for the AM5 platform. Now that's still an awful lot of computing power, especially when we consider the clock frequency improvements as well as IPC. But um, yeah, as for Zen 5, that's apparently when I've personally been hearing of higher core counts from, again, sources that I've been speaking to, AMD did for one point or another actually consider releasing a higher core count Zen 4 processor for AM5 but they basically decided against it. Apparently there were some internal tests which didn't obviously materialize to products that are going to release to customers but they had considered it but yeah Zen 5 will be I'm hearing at least 24 cores possibly 32 although I wouldn't bank on the latter and you can imagine just how much performance that will actually bring to the table. Recently Grayman has actually mentioned exactly the same thing that we're seeing uh, 8, 12 and 16 cores for you know various uh, you know, SKU models. And apparently we're going to be seeing 105 watts for the 12 core, which is actually new information to me, and 170 watts for the 16 core. Now, this is actually something that I've personally said in a couple of videos previously, that there is 170 watt variance. And it's actually kind of interesting because I've been getting a lot of mixed information personally in the 170 watt. One source told me that they think it's like a halo skew and there's going to be variants which are going to be lower TDP, uh, but there's still 16 cores. Another source told me that this is like a 3D cache version, much like the 5800X 3D, although only a single person's told me this and I can't get it verified, so personally I'm not really running with that. Um, but what we have seen, of course, from AMD already is a demonstration of the, six, uh, oh, sorry, of, uh, the Ryzen Silicon. And um, yeah, it's basically been running at 5 gigahertz or cores, and it's looking to be really impressive. Performance, though, will be absolutely ridiculous. Now, we've already seen kind of a preview of what AMD are looking to achieve with its next generation of processors in the form of the 5800X 3D. For those who have missed AMD's official benchmarks, and I put it in such quotes, because ultimately they're internal numbers, and until we actually get to run them ourselves, you know, a grain of salt on all of that. But they are looking to be around 10 to 15% faster than a similarly equipped 5800 x which is actually really impressive now you can immediately say to yourself well gee there's no way amd will be releasing a am5 platform and all the accompanying other stuff that you know customers would need to upgrade to without it being considerably faster than that and of course you're going to be right 
I've mentioned a couple of times, I believe, that um, in hearing around 25% improvement in terms of the uh, IPC, and this does seem to be bearing out, and most likely it's going to be possibly around 40% total. Now, this is one T, so this is going to be single core versus, you know, single core, or actually more accurately, single thread versus single thread. And the clock frequency is looking to be the low 5 gigahertz. I've heard uh, it's going to be 5 gigahertz or around 5.2. Although I believe the 5.2 might be all core, 5.2, 5.3. And I personally wouldn't believe it's going to be much more than that. Um, unless you're going like really exotic cooling and willing to put like a nuclear furnace to try and power the damn thing. And... Yeah, I also want to clear up another rumour as well. There's been some rumours that it's going to support, that is AM5, DDR4. And I would love this to be the case. I absolutely would. Um, older Lake CPUs, of course, they do support DDR4 as well as DDR5. And um, I don't believe it's going to happen. I would love for AMD to support it in AM5, but... I've heard absolutely no plans, so unless, you know, something's just flown under, under the radar, again, I could be wrong, um, I have asked a couple of people and they've all said, nope, it is not happening, it's only DDR5. Now, the problem, of course, with that is it will make the adoption for users who don't have DDR5 memory, and let's face it, in terms of percentage share, if you've got older, like, you may not be that interested in jumping onto um, AM5, but, uh, yeah, most people, of course, are going to have to buy new memory and all of that, which is going to be quite expensive because DDR5 memory at the moment isn't exactly cheap. But it will get cheaper, of course, as the market starts to switch towards it. And this is pretty standard for, you know, different memory stack. That was a really terrible sentence. But it's pretty, you know, normal for different memory standards as the adoption rate increases and all of that. Um, but, yeah. I don't think that we're going to see uh, DDR5, uh, sorry, DDR4 memory supported or anything like that. And now we're going to move over to direct storage. If you've been following Xbox news for any length of time or had an interest in, you know, Microsoft technology, you may have heard of direct storage. For the Xbox, it is one of the reasons that the console is so much faster than what we've been enjoying on the PC. Basically, you can boil it down to being a storage API. And now the API itself has become officially released by Microsoft for Windows, but there's no games at the moment, to my knowledge anyway, which officially support it. With that said, technically software can start to be developed around it. And we actually have a game for Spoken, which is actually going to be leveraging this technology along with other cool things like FSR2. I'm going to discuss FSR2 in a separate video because, quite frankly, there is so much to, uh, today that's kind of been happening. Uh, it's another reason I'm kind of touching on some stuff quite briefly because... Um, I'm actually working on a VRS video at the moment and another thing and basically everything's just happening at once because of GDC and everything else. I'm like, Nyah! yes, uh, <laughs> so it's interesting, um, but yeah, with direct storage, it's uh, a really cool technology. Now, with the Xbox, it uses custom hardware basically to decompress data on the fly so essentially it's reading the data compressed on the uh, xbox's ssd and then it essentially uses custom silicon to decompress that data and then uh, plonk it into the xbox's memory which of course is based on gddr6 for the pc things work a little bit differently though obviously the pc does not have custom decompression blocks at the moment well i suspect that's going to change as i've mentioned previously um, you know, decompression blocks, I think, are going to become, as well as hardware accelerators, are going to become pretty prevalent. In fact, AMD themselves have basically hinted this already. But sticking to direct storage for a moment, this means then direct storage basically can decompress data utilizing your GPU. And it does so by basically data which is dedicated directly to the CPU itself. Uh, gets well decompressed by the CPU so pretty much business as usual however the majority of data which is streamed in typically 
will often be GPU data, so that's new textures or whatever other assets. And so in this case, it's basically fed to the GPU directly without being touched by or processed by the CPU. And then the GPU basically does its magical thing. And obviously this is considerably faster drastically reduces the overhead as well. Now, I've discussed direct storage and the whole gamut of this technology previously in another video, predominantly revolving around the Xbox, although the principles are pretty similar. Uh, I will be touching on direct storage a lot more in depth for the PC when more software is available and we can start to test it. But with that said, there has already been a benchmark, of course, via Forspoken. And this is a really cool looking game. Um, I'm not so sure about the writing based upon what I've seen so far, but the gameplay itself does look really cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, as a graphical kind of, or rather technical showcase, the, the game looks amazing. Um, and basically they've shown it running on three different hard drive setups. There's an M2 drive, and then obviously you've got the traditional Spinny Boy uh, mechanical drive, and then finally a SATA SSD. I won't say anything more than you can see the results yourself on screen, and the uh, M2, of course, absolutely spanks. Now, one of the reasons th that we're also seeing such a speed up is because it drastically changes the I.O., uh, the way that the actual operating system handle, or rather the game itself, handles I.O. requests on the drive. And basically, it can put a lot more requests in. It can basically batch those requests. It reduces overhead. And long story short, it's going to be really cool. Um, I suspect it's going to be one of those things where adoption rate will be a little slower. Um, as always, like, look how long DirectX 12, for example, took to become, uh, you know, really well used in games. But I suspect when we start to shift towards it, uh, it'll be really interesting. It'll be very curious actually being able to have games which can be toggled with direct storage on and off. I don't know if you're going to be able to do that. I probably imagine not. Maybe if you're using like certain OS configurations or something like that. But it'll be really interesting to see how all of this plays out. I think that we're going to be in for an amazing generation of games, or rather, upcoming generation of games. Or generation of games now, if you're playing on the Xbox. You, you get the idea. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. There is going to be a second video today, which is going to focus on FSR 2 as well as Intel's XESS. With that said, thank you very much for checking out this one, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.